Welcome back to another episode of the Six Piece Podcast. Today we're looking at Chapter 11 from Fred Duar's novel, The Longest Memory. This is a really different chapter in terms of the structure because essentially it's newspaper articles, uh, more so, I guess, editorials from a newspaper called The Virginian. And it also includes correspondence with Lydia, who is referred to as Miss L, and possibly Chapel as well, because there's references to an, to an enslaved human writing to the newspaper. Now, these editorials discuss a range of issues around education, enslavement, religion, relationships, the abolitionist movement in the North. It sort of discusses, I guess, the context of the time. It's a really um, important chapter in terms of the context, the setting, the time and place in which this text is set. And it provides us with some information in terms of how um, powerful institutions think and why they think certain things. So in this case, the newspaper and the editorial is meant to really sort of summarise the general feeling of the time of what's happening in Virginia. I will note, and it's the last point here, while the editorial appears to be slightly progressive, it still upholds the systemic racism and is particularly, the editor is particularly offended by Lydia and Chapel's relationship and their dreams to continue that in the North. So there are some areas where I definitely think that the editorial takes maybe a different perspective than what would be the overarching view of the people in Virginia. Um, but at the same time, uh, particularly with the very intense um, language that's used towards the end of this, um, is quite horrified by Lydia and Chapel. In terms of the key themes in this particular chapter, well, racism and discrimination, once again, um, is evident throughout in terms of the views at the time. Uh, education and, in fact, uh, teaching and learning uh, of enslaved humans is definitely picked up upon. The, the notion of assimilation, which obviously is important when it comes to uh, Chapel and Lydia and their dreams for, uh, I guess, to continue their relationship in the North, it's definitely discussed as are those last sort of four points. So freedom, justice, power, and equality. Because what it essentially tries to sort of summarize is a general feeling of the South as opposed to that uh, in the North. And again, it's set against the relationship between Lydia and Chapel, which we've heard about in the previous chapters. So there's a real tonal shift here, going from that you know warm, loving, caring, nurturing relationship between Lydia and, and Chapel, but also I guess Chapel and Cook as well, and, and the love they share for each other, to that more, you know, um, straightforward, direct uh, newspaper article styling. So um, very similar to Seven Stages of Grieving when it comes to the court report um, with Daniel Fox's death, um, which is chapter, I think it's seen sort of 15-ish. Um, but yeah, a real sort of tonal shift in the text here with this particular chapter. Chapter 11, The Virginian, December 3, 1809. It is neither extraordinary to beat a slave, nor incompatible with Christianity to wield a whip. The love I hold for God is put in abeyance during such a degrading, unavoidable act of discipline. Do not be fooled into thinking that he who holds a whip is tarnished by it. What he holds is responsibility for the destiny of several lives balanced against his need to prosper. This makes him a creature unlike any of us, simply because his responsibility is something most of us will never know. We will publicly cast aspersion at him, but privately we will be glad never to have to know it. If for a day we could carry the weight of such responsibility, we would gladly be rid of it. He who wields a whip must sleep with himself. He must remember how to love. He has to lest he forget and find his hand has become indistinguishable from the whip. Then the whip cannot be put aside. Any fool can beat a foolish slave. Only man can do it and remain dignified. Only a man. January 7, 1810. A man purchased a slave from another man who sold the said slave without realising she was with child. Upon discovery of this fact, the seller wished further compensation from the buyer for the unborn child. The buyer said he refused to pay more since the original purchase was made without prior knowledge of the fact that he was getting himself a bargain, two for the price of one. This manner of retrospective justice cannot be argued in a court of law. Otherwise, I could be charged with robbery because I ask a borrower for a certain percentage of interest on a loan, which he invests unwisely and loses when all I've done is furnish that borrower with money he could otherwise not have at considerable inconvenience to myself. Were I to increase my interest on the loan upon discovering that the borrower has quadrupled it in a wise investment, I would be totally unjustified in doing so 
since in providing the loan, I had no way of knowing it would make the adventurous borrower any return. Nor would it be my interest to care if it did or did not do so. Therefore, I say to the gentleman, consider yourself fortunate if, you purchased your, if your purchased slave does not die in childbirth and the infant perish along with the mother. Ask the seller if, under these circumstances, he would not be prepared to refund your money to you. February 4, 1810. If slaves are stock, should we be concerned about the sale of a woman and her children that might very well result in their separation? This good question raises a philosophical inquiry into the degree of humanity we should accord slaves. Are we to attribute to slaves all the qualities we credit to ourselves as human beings? I think not. The premise of the buying and selling of Africans is built upon precepts concerning their difference from our good selves. They are, quite literally, not like us. They do not feel what we feel. They do not value what we value. They will exhibit habits of attachment not unlike those observed among other kinds of stock on the plantation, a cow to its newborn calf, a mare to its foal. It is wise not to confuse such displays of attachment and habit with love. At the auction block, get the best price for your investment, even if it means breaking up the capital into smaller holdings and selling each holding separately. March 3, 1810. What is a just punishment for a slave who is a runaway? The practice has been to administer something in the region of 200 lashes with further restrictions of diet and maybe leg irons for a week or two afterwards. This seems just and fair. The assumption is twofold. One, that the runaway intended to rob the plantation of his labour for evermore. And two, that his capture should serve as an example to dissuade others from attempting such a grand theft. If the years of service left to the plantation are calculated when that slave runs and a figure is put upon it, would it not amount to a sum of several hundred, hundreds of dollars? Even though the postulated sum is recovered upon the slave's recapture, he should still be punished for the theft of his services from his master. To this end, I've known overseas who have advocated dispensing of that runaway slave altogether on the grounds that he is poison among other slaves and will himself never settle into the job again. This does not excuse the use of bloodhounds to gorge on the flesh of that slave until he perishes, nor the use of the lash until death, and then the public showing of the carcass beyond the point of decay. It must add to the bitterness of the slaves rather than remedy any dissatisfaction in them. The key here is to punish firmly by using punishment as instruction. There is this too. The slave must be a living example of someone who has failed in his attempt at escape. He must act as a living reminder of that failure to all who might entertain such a notion. The trouble with the dead runaway, however brutal the means of death, is quite simply that the next slave soon convinces himself that he can evade the hounds and the whip and the chains. April 7, 1810. What should be done with the very old slave who has given a life of good service, but who is now too old to be of much use? It seems unjust to me to simply chase him off the plantation or abandon him in some strange place as is practice among the overseers. There must be some lighter duty around the plantation to occupy that slave. The old slave is often a repository of wisdom to the young slave. I know of an old slave on a plantation who does nothing in the way of labour all day except shepherd the young slave children. He instructs them about the duties of obedience a slave owes to his master and in discipline and hard work. This type of old slave is an asset to the end of his days. He is a living example to the young, of the slave who can work hard and live to a ripe old age. Keep your old slaves around the plantation and see if that does not alter the general air of good cheer for the better. June 30, 1810. Young, newborn female slaves are a temptation to us all, but one that should be religiously avoided. They are blessed with youth and inspire feelings of lust in overseers and masters alike that are human to experience when they occur, but wrong to act upon. I say this because of the offspring who have no place as slaves, and certainly they do not have a place in the household of the overseer or master who has succumbed to such temptations. If these female slaves are used in this way, they engender bitterness in a house between the overseer and his wife, or the master and his wife. The slave may even become aware of this influence and exploit it to his own advantage. I therefore argue for restraint. June 
Couple that young female slave with a male as soon as you can to remove the sight of her and keep her busy with childbearing. This is a sole just return of your investment in the young female slave, none other. The stories of these indiscretions always have sad if not disastrous outcomes. Two days ago, I heard of a slave who was whipped to death by an overseer, who subsequently learned the slave was his half-brother. July 14, 1810 is Christianity incompatible with slavery? This is an old chestnut. The immediate answer is, of course it is not. Otherwise, the 150-year-old practice of the latter would have been driven would have driven the former from our midst. Slavery is a business. Christianity is a faith. Slavery answers to our physical and material well-being. Christianity looks after the hunger of the soul. The two are different types of sustenance for two different kinds of need. One is exterior, the other interior. One is tangible, the other intangible. How then are they always confused? The answer is not simple. Once we extend Christian values to include slaves, we, we then throw into question the very basis of our forced enslavement of them. The confusion is this. The extension of Christian principles to a slave is seen as the inclusion of that slave in all aspects of our Christian life. This view is wrong. It should be possible to treat a slave with Christian fairness and instruct him in the Christian faith as a just substitute for his pagan practices without nullifying the relationship of master and slave. It has to be. Otherwise, Christianity could not spread. Otherwise, the African would be deemed our equal simply because he shared our faith in one God and the afterlife. We know both of the above to be false because of the evidence of our Africans live in their primitive land. For God's sake, remember where they came from before you thrust them upon an equal platform with ourselves. August 4, 1810. How should the plantation be run, firm or kind? Those on the side of firm argue that it keeps slaves in their place and at a suitable distance from the master and overseer. This distance, they argue, facilitates a smooth running of the plantation. Those on the side of kind approach point to the number of runaways on the firm policy plantations as evidence of the failure of the whip and stick, stock and chains, bloodhounds and general abuse. They argue for a good diet for slaves instead of keeping them hungry. Good dry shelters instead of hovels even the bloodhounds would not be housed in. Fair amounts of rest from work to facilitate an air of hard work equals good treatment. The kind approach says what is called firmness is often inhumane an unnecessary practice against slaves. They say profit is not increased by it. Let me declare, I am somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. As a businessman, I can understand that some aspects of the firm approach, such as harsh punishments for runaways and in, in, indolence, are essential. As a Christian, it seems only right to reward hard work and provide a minimum standard of comfort. If that comfort can be assigned to bloodhounds, then why not slaves? The word is neither firm nor kind in my view. The proper word is fair. A fair approach to the resolution of all problems on the plantation on the basis that the interest of the plantation is uppermost on the list of priorities. The lot of the slave need not be miserable. September 1, 1810. I was asked if slavery will ever come to an end. Clearly my answer was going to be of critical importance to the questioner who wanted me to answer in the negative unhesitatingly. Much to his consternation, I took my time. I said to him, after a long pause, when I stared at the heavens, that his question had a yes answer, at which his face fell, and a no answer, at which his expression became gleeful, and asked him which did he hear, care to hear first. He said the negative. I said that in so far as man's labour will always be required in the cotton, corn and tobacco fields to name some, I could see no end to slavery. In reply to the affirmative, I said the world was changing rapidly. 150 years of slavery was a long time. Advances in techniques for manufacturing goods must at some stage influence the work of slaves and result in much cheaper ways of doing things. How soon, he wondered. I said not in our lifetime, nor that of our children. This cheered him up, mightily. He shook my hand and strode off as if I'd written a decree outlawing any interference with the institution of slavery. The long stretch of time I quoted for its demise was reason for his jubilation. It is not.
the growing number of freed blacks in our midst is one indication of this. May 5, 1810. An intriguing question was put to me by a reader who requested that her identity be kept secret. So I shall use the initial of her first name, L. Miss L wondered if it would not be more profitable to pay blacks for the work instead of keeping them as slaves and having to provide for all their needs in exchange for their labour. This seems laughable to many upon first hearing of it, but it does merit further consideration. I did some calculations and came up with the following. If I understand Miss L correctly, she means by hire a sum paid to the black just for his work in a market where the price would be set according to how much need was placed on that labour. This is not a fixed cost. If, say, there are 500 free blacks and five plantations need 100 each, then the owners of those five plantations could conceivably decide between themselves before hiring what they are prepared to pay each hired black. But if the same five plantations wanted 150 slaves each, they would have to compete among themselves to attract that labour. The inverse is true if only 50 slaves were needed for each plantation out of a quantity of 500 slaves. On some occasions, it would work for the blacks, on others for the plantation owners. It all sounds too rife with variables to be practical, though I grant you it is an intelligent question from a lady. Thank you, Miss L. May 12, 1810. Miss L has properly pointed out to me that my editorial in last week's edition gave the impression that slavery was a static and stable institution, whereas her proposal was wild with fluctuations. She argued that she has witnessed an escalation in costs at her father's plantation without a corresponding increase in profits, both of which indicate to her delicate mind that slavery is a growing expense and the returns from it is it and the returns from it a diminishing one. Miss L, your father's plantation is only one example, though I, I am sure an excellent one. The rising costs may have more to do with inefficiency than some natural inevitable escalation. As for your point about diminishing profits, you will find that the pattern is true for most plantations in the present depressed climate. We can only hope for an upturn at a date not far from now. I must say, Miss L, this does not place slavery on the same slippery foundation as your open market system, nor does it indicate, as you seem to believe, that slavery is dying as an institution. Thank you for your correspondence. May 19, 1810. An astonishing thing has happened that forces me to think of changing the policy of this paper. I'd assume that these humble pages were read by educated white Virginians alone. It transpires that there are literate slaves in our midst who read this paper to themselves and aloud to slaves who cannot read. One such slave has written to me in the most articulated letter I, could, I, I have received in a long time. In it, he argues that these pages should carry stories about slaves told by the slaves themselves. It is a point worth entertaining. In past debates in these pages, it might have benefited some of the arguments if the point of view of the black were heard as well. I would have printed the letters, but it is dictated to some undisclosed person who has written it on behalf of the slave. In addition, the policy of this paper is not to include correspondence from slaves. It occurs to me that not using his own hand to write the letter may have been an attempt by the slave to get around this policy. Perhaps not. The literacy of slaves is generally frowned upon, nay, positively discouraged in most quarters. I am of the opinion that if it benefits a plantation to have literate slaves, then so be it. By the same token, if it benefits our readers to hear the viewpoint of slaves and free blacks alongside their own, then so be it. Write in with your opinion on the matter. May 26, 1810. The overwhelming response to last week's question concerning the literacy of slaves and the inclusion of their thoughts in these pages was a resounding no. As an indication of how this matter can divide families, two responses came from a father and his daughter who wrote in separately. The father said no, definitely not. The daughter said yes, and about time. The father said it filled a slave with discontent when he can read about the world but must live on a plantation as a slave and see nothing of that world. He added it was unethical to instill in a slave such an outlook and he went so far as to claim it was detrimental to the workings of the plantation. His view was upheld by the vast majority of readers. The minority view is nevertheless deserving of some discussion. As outlined by the daughter, 
It argues that it is wrong to decide what a slave should and should not know, and doubly wrong to rob that slave of the joys of literacy. She said it made slaves better people. In fact, she advocates literacy for all, since, in her view, it would improve mankind. Whatever we may think of this young lady's opinions, we must grant that she demonstrates intelligence and certain advantages that go with being young, namely, an unmitigated idealism. This is as it should be. It is the young, after all, who hold dominion over the future. June 2, 1810. A deputy to an overseer has written to me saying too much attention is paid to the plantation owners and to the slaves at the expense of that level of poor whites who have to work for the former in close proximity to the latter. He argues that the lives of some of these whites are barely one rung above that of sharing the conditions of a slave. Furthermore, many free blacks with a trade live and eat better than these whites. That cannot be right, he laments. Moves to emancipate growing numbers of slaves exacerbate the already awful situation of these impoverished whites. He issued a threat, which is not in my normal practice to heed or publicise, but which had a particular vision of the future that made me think I should make an exception on this occasion. In his view, these whites will rise up and exact such a revenge on the blacks that none will be left to see it. He does not stop there. They could very well turn upon those rich whites who have ignored the plight of their poor brothers and treated them as if they were merely blacks who were free. June 9, 1810. Many readers agreed with the outlook of last week's featured letter. Many felt these whites were the forgotten stratum of society. Some confessed that they had first-hand experience of the treatment of the free black when they tried to get work at a plantation. They were either sent off with a rude word or dismissed out of hand when their services were no longer required. There is no excuse for employees to treat the labour they need to hire as if they were slave labour. It is not. The differences are many and important. Though obvious, they are, in clear, they are in clear need of reiteration. One is free, the other is not. One is white, the other black. One comes from the less fortunate portions of our ancestry, the other is not equal nor derived from our race. The interests of these whites should therefore supersede those of the slaves and free blacks whenever the two come into conflict. I do not subscribe to the vision of a violent future if the interests of these whites continue to be ignored. I do not for the simple reason that their Christian faith will act as a restraint. I certainly do not see them attacking their own kind, however, wide the gap between their need and the other privilege becomes. June 16, 1810. There is no sight more perfidious than that of a white woman with a black man. I was in New York and witnessed examples of this and left appalled and enthralled that my home was made here in the verdant hills of this blessed state where no such displays are ever likely to occur. There is so much wrong with it. It is so far from us here that I should not grace the idea with any further discussion. But there is something in it that did not all go well for the future in these bounteous United States. Namely, what will become of the offspring from these heinous alliances? Where is their place in these states? when they see themselves as our equal and feel it too because the blood courses through their veins. The same argument applies to masters and overseers who satisfy their concupiscence on slaves without due consideration of the consequences. I grant that the latter are born as slaves and therefore come to know their station and are less of a problem than those who are born free and then have to learn that they are not and live with that. June 23. 1810. Miss L wrote in and called my thinking on last week's issue concerning the perfidy of li li liaisons between white women, they are not ladies, and black men, unconstitutional. The writer did not say whether my condemnation of the same behaviour in whites, namely masters and overseers, towards black women was also unconstitutional. Nor did the writer comment on whether my vision of their offspring as posing a problem for society was similarly unconstitutional. I suppose it is unconstitutional to warn against practices that harm the smooth working of a country. Perhaps it is equally unconstitutional to wonder where it all will end. Miss L is a previous correspondent who has brought reason to this column in the past. 
I credited her at the time with intelligence. I see now I was grossly mistaken. She exhibits a love for blacks that clouds her ability to reason about any subject involving them. Her thinking puts her in the bracket of females who end up in the north walking arm in arm down a dingy street with a black man. Should this occur, at least she will have been the mistress of her own fate, which is, I will allow, as constitutional as a person can get. Let's look at some key quotations. I've picked out about seven or eight here, but there's so many you could take from this text. Uh, the first one, a man purchased a slave from another man who sold the said slave without realising she was with child. The seller wished further compensation from the buyer for the unborn child. Um, here we see a real lack of humanity in terms of the treatment and oppression of enslaved humans and the commodification. They are literally treated as monetary goods, as objects here. The next quotation, are we to attribute to slaves all qualities we credit ourselves as human beings? I think not. Again, the racist mindset in the society is clear in this particular quotation, but what I think is interesting to note is the short sentence of I think not. It's quite blunt and lacks any real emotion. It's really, really direct and is harsh in the way that it delivers the answer to this question, one of humanity, really. The next quotation, they are quite literally not like us. They do not feel what we feel. They do not value what we value. We've seen a lot of quotations like this that show the power imbalance within this society, but this is ironic for me because it is Chapel that feels love and acceptance, unlike the other characters, and it's Chapel who values education. And I think that's a really great quotation <clears throat> that you can link in to the use of irony within this text. And the last quotation, young nubile female slaves are a temptation to us all, but one that should be religiously avoided. They are blessed with youth and inspire feelings of lust in overseers and masters alike. I've mentioned here gender, and again, we can see particularly female slaves like Cook who are abused and raped. Um, in this case, though, notice how it is female slaves who are blamed. They inspire feelings of lust in overseers. It is those in power who are not blamed. They are not held to account. They look for others to blame and they are allowed to because it's authorities like, in this case, the media who justify their actions here and uphold their views and beliefs. A couple more quotations here. Miss L wondered if it would be more profitable to pay blacks for their work instead of keeping them as slaves and having to provide for all their needs in exchange for their labor. It all sounds too rife with variables to be practical, though I grant you it is an intelligent question from a lady. Uh, two parts here. Um, the use of italics, something that you could definitely look at. In this chapter, there's quite a few italics that the editor uses. In this case, for me, he does so to emphasize the absurdity of the proposal. But also at the same time, it reflects what Lydia and Chapel are fighting against. Their relationship, one built on love, on trust, on caring, on education, on these really righteous values, is one that is essentially put down by the Virginian society at the time. In fact, not just put down, it's, it's labelled as being quite disgusting, as we'll see a little bit later on. The other thing I wanted to raise is this idea of gender, which we can look at in both texts, and it's women who are not valued for their intelligence. Later on, she's described as having a delicate mind, and it ties in with the previous chapter where Lydia is valued for her etiquette, her carriage and composure, when her parents are trying to sell her off to a husband, to an eligible bachelor. Second last quotation. The overwhelming response to last week's question concerning the literacy of slaves and the inclusion of their thoughts in these pages was a resounding no. Note how the editor wasn't completely against it. He did raise the questions, uh, the question around whether we should be hearing from enslaved humans in their perspective. But the readers are completely against him. Again, that short statement of, of, of no suggests that. It also suggests that this will be a really difficult mindset to change. In fact, it's going to take a civil war for it to actually change in this part of the country. And the last quotation, there is no sight more perfidious than that of a white woman with a black man. And then in relation to Lydia, she exhibits a love for blacks that clouds her ability to reason about any subject involving them. Really strong language and strong tone. You know, it's full of hate, of bitterness, and full of resentment. Once again, highlighting what Lydia and Chapel have to fight against.
So let's look at some connections that we can make between this particular chapter and the seven stages of grieving. And I'll begin by outlining the role of the media. In this particular chapter, of course, we have, well, it's completely editorials from a newspaper and they endorse and perpetuate, in fact, racist views. You can take any quote from this chapter, really, that states a racist view and link it to scene 15 March, where we have the news headlines that say defiant Aboriginal March an Aboriginal March traffic stopper, which is in complete contrast to the description of the woman who calls it a peaceful march. So what's the role of the media? Well, they reiterate the idea that powerful authoritative institutions who are not held to account. In fact, the media justifies their violence or their actions even as well. Note as well how both the newspaper, which is quite dismissive of the march, is similar to the Virginian who is quite dismissive of Lydia's dreams of walking hand in hand with that of Chapel. In fact, they call her actions vile and disgusting. So again, both medias in the text are quite dismissive of any future acts of, say, rebellion. Something else to mention as well is voices and the importance in recognising storytelling. So here we have the editor that states he, meaning Chapel, argues that these papers should carry stories about slaves told by slaves themselves. We compare that to the same scene from last time, March. We come from a long tradition of storytelling. If this is the only way we can get our story told. And this two quotes perfectly encapsulate the authorial intent of the text. What both texts are trying to do is showcase the importance of minorities sharing their stories of injustice. And in doing so, they can inform educate and even change perspectives, which potentially leads to change throughout wider society. What you'll note is, you know, in both cases, we see acts of rebellion really um, against the, the times. And there is a sense of, of, of hope for both characters to an extent. Something else I wanted to raise is the tonal shift. And you could compare the Virginian, which is again, quite direct and quite informative and compare that to court 14, uh, scene 14, which is told in the style of a court report, that being Daniel Vox's death. And here we can see them, well, both texts really lacking any real empathy or awareness of what these characters are going through. And once again, depicts these powerful authorities being media, courts, police, you know, legal systems as almost being excused and, 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 and almost their actions are defended, like the police, police's actions against Daniel Vox are defended and, and justified. So once again, this is a great chapter to focus on if you're looking at the power imbalance within both societies. And I guess the reason behind rebellion, the reason why individuals stand up against these authorities, such as media, police, governments, and legal systems.